We've got a function. For example, this first example, example one, is going to be f of x equals x cubed plus 2x plus 1. And what is our goal? Our goal, you could say, is to graph this function. And you say, okay, teacher, I'll get my calculator out. No, we're going to try to graph it without technology. But then you ask, why? Why would we bother? Because it's not just about getting a graph. It's about understanding why the graph looks the way it does. And when you understand why the graph looks the way it does, it can help you with harder problems. It can help you, yes, even with multivariable calculus as well. So we want to gain skill at understanding why the graph looks the way it does. Derivatives are a useful tool for that task. This is cubic. Its derivative is going to be a quadratic. Its derivative is 3x squared plus 2. When you use derivatives to help you graph or and or understand the graph of the original function, you want to think about where is the derivative positive, where is it negative? And that means figuring out where it equals 0. You typically want to try to set the derivative equal to 0 and solve for x. However, with this example, if you do, uh, you find there are no real solutions. There are no real number values of x that make this zero. It's, it's positive for all values of x, right? Two is positive, three is positive. x squared is greater than or equal to zero, no matter what real number x is. This has no real number solutions. Does it have imaginary number solutions? As you might know, yes, it does. What are the imaginary number solutions? They are solutions of 3x squared equals negative 2. So x squared is negative 2 thirds. So x is plus or minus i times the square root of negative 2 thirds, where i is, or positive 2 thirds there, where i squared is negative 1. And you say, hey, teacher, there is no such number. And I say, yes, there is. It's called the imaginary unit. And you say, well, that's a figment of your imagination. And I say, you're right, but I don't care because it's useful. What? Yes, imaginary numbers are useful. I am completely serious. I am not pulling your chain. I am not joking. Imaginary and complex numbers are very useful. In fact, they make things simpler, even though they're called complex numbers. We're not going to go into them in this class. You will if you, a little bit if you take Calc 2. You definitely will if you take differential equations and or electronics. Or if you happen to get into a lot about quantum mechanics that comes up in modern physics and physical chemistry classes. Imaginary numbers are very useful in those classes. Anyway, that's an aside. For the moment, this has no real number solutions. In other words, this derivative is never zero. And in fact, in fact, f prime of x is greater than or equal to two, which is positive for all real values of x. This would mean, you could say, because of a theorem from last Friday, therefore, the increasing function theorem, IFT, IFT means increasing function theorem, if you want to write that down, implies F is increasing over any interval on the real number line. You can say over the entire real number line. Its graph is always going up, never going down. Moreover, you could say its slope is always even greater than or equal to 2. It's always steeper than 45 degrees on a standard scale. Can we say more about it before we actually graph it? Yes, we can use the second derivative to say more f double prime of x 
The second derivative, of course, we know is the derivative of the first derivative. So I have to differentiate the first derivative and get 6x. Setting that equal to zero is also useful because it helps you figure out possible locations of what are called inflection points. I'll explain what they are when I make the drawing. That's a pretty simple equation to solve, right? 6x equals zero means x itself is zero. Not much to do there. So at x equals zero, there's a possible inflection point there. Possible inflection point for the graph of f at x equals zero. But what is an inflection point? Let's start to draw the graph and that'll help me explain what an inflection point is. I, I think I mentioned it before, but you may have forgotten. Before I graph it, let me remind you of some other things. This function being cubic means the end behavior is either like this or like that. And I'm trying to do a little dance here, but I'm sitting down so it doesn't work so well. Like this, sort of like that, meaning, okay, if the, well, if the coefficient of x cubed is positive as it is, it's like this. It's going up forever and ever. It goes to infinity as x goes to infinity and goes down forever and ever. It goes to minus infinity as x itself goes to minus infinity. So you know the end behavior is like that. You also know the y-intercept is the value of this function when x is zero, f of zero is one. The y-intercept is one. Pretend that's one there. I also can tell you something else about the graph near x equals zero. When x is close to zero, the x cubed is really, really, really tiny. For example, if x is 0.1, x cubed is 0 0.001 a hundred times smaller than 0.1. It gets even more extreme. If X is 0 0.01 and I cube that, I get 10 to the negative sixth, which is 10,000 times smaller than 0 0.01. This is 10 to the negative two. That's 10,000 10, times smaller. If X is close to zero, X cubed is gets really, really tiny basically has no effect on the function output. Basically, what I'm trying to say is the function looks like the graph of a linear function 2x plus 1 when x is close to 0. y intercept of 1 and slope of 2. It's got a slope of 2. At that point, in other words, more technically, the tangent line has a slope of 2. What about concavity? Where is it concave down and where is it concave up? It's concave down over intervals where f double prime is negative. Look at f double prime. That's negative when x is negative. The graph's concave down over here. It's got to look like that, part of a frown. It's concave up when f double prime is positive. 6x is positive when x is positive. It's going to be concave up over here. At one, there is an inflection point because the graph has changed concavity from concave down to concave up. That is an inflection point. The precise definition of an inflection point, well, not super precise, but basically here's the idea. You got an inflection point in a graph when the graph changes concavity at that point. In this case, changes from being concave down to being concave up. Part of a frown rhymes with down. To part of a smile does not rhyme with up. Concave down, concave up. Concave down really means the slope is decreasing. The slope, the derivative, reaches a minimum value of 2. The slope of the tangent there is 2 when x equals zero, f prime of zero is two, then the slope increases again. It's concave up over here. 
So thinking about the nature of these simpler functions, quadratic and linear, helps you understand the nature of the cubic function. So again, it's more than just getting a graph, which we can do with technology. It's understanding the graph. Here's example two. F of X is going to be a fourth degree polynomial, but we'll make it a fairly simple one. X to the fourth plus eight X cubed. Before we use calculus to understand the graph of this, let's see what we can figure out by pure algebra. You can figure out some pretty significant things here by pure algebra. There is a common factor of X cubed that can be factored out x to the fourth is x cubed times x. 8x cubed is 8 times x cubed. Can be factored as x cubed times x plus 8. That tells me right away that I've got two x-intercepts at x equals 0 and x equals negative 8. Those are going to be my x-intercepts. If I set this equal to 0 and solve for x, I get 0 and negative 8 as x-intercepts. I can say that without any calculus. I can also say the end behavior is like this, touchdown, because it's fourth degree positive leading coefficient. y goes to infinity, either as x goes to plus infinity or as x goes to minus infinity, both cases. But what is it doing in between? Let's use calculus to help us figure it out. F prime of X, use this part of the formula to do the derivative is four X cubed plus 24 X squared. That is a cubic. It is the value of F prime of X. This can be factored. You can factor out a four X squared. Like this. Set that equal to zero. Solve for x, you get zero and negative six. There are two locations where the derivative happens to be zero here. Wherever the derivative is zero or undefined has a new, has a name, this is a new name. It's called a critical point. These are the critical points. Critical points are where the derivative is zero or where the derivative is undefined. Though polynomials, the derivative is always defined. Okay, we're still not sure how this is gonna be helpful. Let's find the second derivative as well and find X coordinates of possible inflection points. The second derivative is gonna be 12 X squared plus 48x, right? Take the derivative of that. Get 12x squared plus 48x. Factor as much as possible. You can factor a 12x out and be left with x plus 4. Set that equal to 0 and solve for x. And you get 0 and negative 4 as possible inflection points. Are they definitely inflection points or not? We're not sure yet. Technically, the second derivative needs to be more than just zero at these spots. It needs to also change sign. With each of these functions, let me draw a little number line next to it. A blue number line, a red number line, and a green number line corresponding to my blue, my red, my green. On the blue number line, let me mark the locations of the values where f of x is zero, zero and negative eight. And let me think about the sine of f on these three intervals, the middle one between the two x-intercepts and these outer two that are to the right or left of them. What is the sine, positive or negative, of f? You can think about the factored form as x cubed times x plus eight. If you plug a number in, Oops, forgot my negative sign. Between negative eight and zero, like negative four, negative four cubed is negative. Negative four plus eight is positive. Negative times positive is negative. F is negative in here. 
I'll write that like this. Shorthand for saying f of x is always negative in this interval. Plug in a number over here, like oh, one or two or three. You get positive numbers all around. F is positive. Plug a number over here, like negative nine or negative 10. Think about it in the factored form. If you plug in negative 10, for example, you get negative 10 cubed is negative. Negative 10 plus eight is also negative. Negative times negative is positive. F is positive over here, which it would have to be if the end behavior is like a touchdown. So the graph is gonna come down and cross the axis and come back up again. But does it look like a parabola? Don't jump too quickly to thinking it might look like a parabola. Let's think about this, the first derivative. It's zero at zero and negative six. What are the signs of the first derivatives in these different intervals? Try first between negative six and zero, like negative three. Hmm, here's something different. Negative three squared is positive nine times positive four is still positive. Negative three plus six is positive. You plug a number in between negative six and zero, you're gonna get a positive derivative. Unlike what happened with the function itself between the two x-intercepts. Plug in a number bigger than zero, like one, positive times positive, it's still positive. That should seem a little strange. Shouldn't it, if it's positive there, shouldn't it be negative there? The answer is oftentimes that happens, but not in this example, it doesn't. It's positive on both sides of this critical point. The derivative is only negative when x is less than negative six. <clears throat> Plug a number negative, like negative seven in here. Negative seven squared is positive times positive four is still positive, <clears throat> but negative seven plus six is negative. Positive times negative is negative. F prime is negative. With the second derivative, your possible inflection points are zero and negative four. <clears throat> Excuse me. Plug in a number between negative four and zero, like negative two. You get a negative times a positive. F double prime is negative. Plug in a positive number, you get a positive second derivative. Plug in a number like negative six or negative five, you get a negative times a negative is positive. Now what do we wanna do is we wanna combine all this information about F, its derivative and its second derivative to help us sketch a graph without technology. Question? Is it just convenience or is it like- From negative eight to negative six to negative four, that's a coincidence. All right. Next one be negative two. Mm -hmm. Where the third derivative is zero, we get 24x plus 48. Yeah, it's happening with this example, but in general, no. <clears throat> All right, we want to take this information and draw a picture of the graph. Start with the x intercepts, there are zero and negative eight. You could also think about the end behavior. It's going to be going up over here as X gets more and more negative and going up over here as X gets more and more positive. Um, you got, let's think about what happens at X equals negative six next. The derivative is negative when x is less than negative six. By the decreasing function theorem, analog of the increasing function theorem, f is gonna be decreasing over the entire interval from minus infinity to negative six. When I get to negative six, the graph is going down the whole way, but then it increases after that point. So I've gotta have a low point of the graph at negative six. What I just said there is very important. F prime is negative for all X less than negative six. Over the entire interval from minus infinity to negative six, the function's always decreasing. 
but the sign of the derivative is changing from negative to positive as you pass through negative six. The slope of this graph while negative over here has to change to become positive once you reach past negative six. Oh, my picture is not so great here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go down a little further here. I'm not saying how big things are on the Y scale here. Gets a little bit more subtle for the rest of this here. F prime is positive thereafter, except it is zero at zero. F prime of zero is zero. The tangent line at the origin has zero slope. It's horizontal. How can that happen if the graph keeps going up? It's going to end up doing something subtle. It's going to do this before going up again. Technically, I've made it so that it is technically increasing when x is bigger than negative 6. But I've made it flatter here at the origin, so flat, in fact, that the tangent line is horizontal there because that does happen. F prime of 0 is 0. 0 is a critical point. Are these possible inflection points actual inflection points? Yes, they are. At negative four, you have a change in concavity from concave up when x is less than negative four to concave down in here. And then you have another change in concavity from concave down to concave up at x equals zero. From concave down to concave up again. So there are two inflection points here and here. There are two critical points x equals negative six and x equals zero. You could also call these points critical points. And there are two inflection points here and here. Question? Could have the x uh, equals, or could have... Yes, he's asking, could this shape have been predicted by the fact that we have an x cubed there? And the answer is yes. The function, when x is close to zero, acts a lot like 8x cubed. This x to the fourth is much smaller than 8x cubed when x is close to zero. So it acts like that, and it's, that's emphasized by the x cubed there as well. So this graph acts, acts like x cubed when x is close to zero, and that's why it looks like this. Some more terminology. This critical point, where the graph has a low point, in fact, it is the lowest point on the graph, is called an extreme point, a minimum point. It is both a local and a global minimum. Both a local minimum and global minimum. What do I mean by that? A local minimum is kind of like the name implies. It's a place where you're standing in a valley, so to speak, a low point of the graph. But some graphs might have a local minimum like this and then go lower over here. This one doesn't. If you had such a graph that came down like this, then goes back up, then went back down again, then this local minimum would not be a global minimum. It would not be the lowest point on the graph overall. But this point for this function is the lowest point on the graph. So it is also a global minimum. Global minima are local, but local minima are not always global. That should make intuitive sense thinking about local versus global in the usual sense of the words. What's the min value? This is all related to an important application called optimization. What is the minimum value? I'd have to plug in the critical point, negative six, into the function. I'd have to find f of negative six. It's going to be some negative values. It's the second coordinate of this point. Going back up to the formula for f, it's there. This is negative six to the fourth plus eight times negative six cubed. 
negative six to the fourth is gonna be the same as positive six to the fourth is 1,296. Negative six cubed is gonna be negative 216 times eight is negative 1728. The global minimum value is negative 432. That's the second coordinate of this point. Doesn't look like it's negative 432, does it? Okay, that's because it's hard to say until you calculate something like this, what scale you should use for the y-axis. Now I know. If I was gonna use graph this as a window, I better go down to at least y equals negative 450 or so to see the function well. To prove that this is a local minimum, you need either something called the first derivative test or the second derivative test. What does the first derivative test say? The first derivative test says that at a critical point, that's not an endpoint of the domain, if there were endpoints, they're not here, but at a critical point, that's not an endpoint of the domain, you're going to have a local minimum if the derivative changes sign from negative to positive as x increases through that critical point. Say that again. Listen really carefully. The first derivative, derivative test says that at a critical point, like negative six, that's not an endpoint of the interval, that's the domain, which we don't have to worry about in this example because it's the entire real number line. You're going to have a local minimum there if the derivative changes sign from negative to positive as x increases through their critical point. That's exactly what's happening here. At negative six, the derivative is changing sign from negative to positive as x increases through that critical point. Therefore, that's a guarantee that you have a local minimum at the critical point. Not necessarily a global minimum, though we do in this example, but a local. On the other hand, if the derivative changed sign from positive to negative, as X increased through a critical point, then you'd have a global maximum, a local maximum, like the top of a little hill. If the graph looked like this, there's the top of a hill, that's a local maximum. And the derivative is changing sign from positive to negative as X increases through that critical point. That would be a guarantee of a local maximum. There is another critical point though, negative six. Is that a local max or a local min? Uh, it's neither. If you think about the graph near this critical point, there are places where it's lower and there are places where it's higher. It's neither a local maximum nor a local minimum. So what does the first derivative test say? It doesn't say anything. Because at this critical point, the derivative does not change sign. It's positive on either side of it. Alternatively, another way to verify that we have a local minimum at this critical point is to use something called the second derivative test. So the first derivative test or the second derivative test can be used to verify local max or mins. You don't have to use both. You can use one or the other, although the directions might say use the first derivative test or use the second derivative test. With the first derivative test, you focus on how does the derivative change sign as you pass to the crit critical point, if at all? With the second derivative test, you focus on the concavity, concave up or concave down nature of the graph near the critical point. Here you can see it looks like it's concave up there. How do you verify that? F double prime of negative six, plug the critical point into the second derivative. There's our formula for the second derivative right there. So I get 12 times negative six squared plus 48 times negative six. We could plug it into the factored form as well. That probably would be easier. Actually, yeah, all we care about is the sign of this. Negative six squared is 36. Okay, I'll go ahead and calculate it here. 36 times 12 is 432. 48 times six is 288. 
This is 144. The important thing about that is that is that's positive. I could have just also looked at the factored form here and see I got a positive answer. This is telling us, as well as the fact that the second derivative is a nice continuous function, that the graph of f is concave up near the critical point. That's another reason why you have a local min at this critical point. Let me summarize. Okay. This is, this is the, still the heart of the course here. With the, if you're trying to verify you have a local max or a local min at some critical point, you can use either the first derivative test or the second derivative test. You don't have to use both, but you should be able to use either. With the first derivative test, you focus on the sign of the derivative, positive or negative, as x increases through the critical point. Through negative six, it changes from negative to positive. At zero, it kept positive. The fact that it changed from negative to positive as you pass through negative six means the graph of f itself changes from decreasing to increasing. You got a local minimum. If it had changed from positive to negative, you'd have a local maximum. If it's not changing sign, then you've got neither. With the second derivative test, you plug the critical point into the second derivative and see if it's positive or negative. If it's positive, that means the graph is concave up near the critical point. It's got to be a min. If it's negative second derivative, the graph's concave down near the point, it's got to be a max. What if it's zero? Uh, then you might have neither. And that's what happens here. F double prime of zero is zero. It's neither. Though there is an example, there are examples where F double prime is zero, but you do have a local max or min. I'll show you an example next time. Have a good day.